Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our event today. That is our very first industry talk of the year. And this time we will focus on shared mobilities. And I have today invited three experts to tell you all about how they support putting shared mobilities on the map. Without further ado, let's jump into the conversation. First, a little bit of housekeeping, though I'm pretty sure that you are all aware of it. Uh, by default, your microphone and camera has been deactivated. However, whenever you want to ask a question, talk, uh, feel free to reactivate them yourselves. Uh, you can also change uh, your name, at least how it appears in the Zoom, using the participant tools. Uh, we would appreciate to have your name and affiliation if you want also pronouns, so we can take the attendance and also send you the slides and the recording after the event. If you need help, my colleague uh, Newton and also my colleagues from the shared mobility team will be available in the chat for any technical questions. For the ones who don't know me yet, I'm Tuto. I'm the Director of Partnership and Events at Mobility Data. I'm based in Paris, France, and I strongly believe that our community will come out stronger with the support of technology. You can reach out to me in French, English, Vietnamese, Spanish, and Japanese. Feel free to ask the question in any language you feel comfortable in. Today's agenda is quite long. Uh, first, I will give you a little bit of an introduction on GBFS and the work we have done so far within the shared mobility team. I see that we also have Heidi in the room. I would like to give a huge shout out to her. She was the one uh, leading this work until very recently, and she will probably be the one to answer your questions better than I do. Uh, then we will have Francis from Transport Data Gov, who will introduce to you the visualization tool that he and his team have developed on GBFS. We will then have Sébastien from Fluctio, who will introduce to you the European Shared Mobility Index, the work and the insights they were able to gain from data coming from the shared mobility industry. And last but not least, we will have Michael from the Open Mobility Foundation, who will tell you all about how they work as support shared mobilities all around the world. And you will see it's not only MDS. First, let's start with uh, GBFS and mobility data. Very quickly, uh, Mobility Data, we are a nonprofit organization. We now have two headquarters, one in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, and one in Paris, France. We have over 110 members uh, that you can see on the map where all our members are located, along with over 20 employees also located on the same map in the light purple color. Our mission is to enable interoperability in transportation system uh, by identifying interests shared by stakeholders, you in the room, the community, the industry representatives. And our answer to that is data format, shared data infrastructure, but above all, standardized data practice. And that is part of why we are welcoming you here today. How is our mission translated? Uh, well, we have three different strategies or three different pillars that are actually talking to uh, each other. Uh, first one is pragmatic specification, GPFS, uh, to make sure that the community have a standardized way to exchange data. And why pragmatic is because we do rely a lot of our work on your input, your feedback, making sure that whatever we create uh, can be used and is useful to the industry. So we go at your pace. Uh, we are also making sure that the data that is shared out there is of high quality to support all the stakeholders uh, to exchange even better data, prom, uh, produce uh, or create innovation products based on that. And uh, for that, we have developed a couple of uh, open source quality tools, uh, some of them obviously in partnership with all the stakeholders in the industry that we would like to thank today. Uh, last but not least, we are also very much attached to creating a thriving ecosystem uh, based on all of you, uh, international stakeholders who are working to create, use, and improve data. Everyone has a voice. Everyone is welcome. 
Now, what is GBFS? First, it stands for General Bike Share Feed Specification. GBFS data described share mobility information. It's traveler-centric, it's not operational, and it is mainly to help people know where to find their favorite shared mobility option. A little bit of history of uh, GBFS. In 2010, so over 10 years ago, the first docked bike share system emerged in different cities in the United States. Mitch, who is, I believe, in the room and part of our team, is the one who actually draft GBFS in 2014. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, in 2015, the draft was extended by Motivate, and it was also endorsed by NAPSA, the NAM North American Bike Share Association, uh, and they were the host of GPFS version 1.0. In 2016, uh, this version was implemented by Motivate, Social Bicycle, Bicycle, PBSC, and others. In 2017, uh, we saw the shared mobility market change with uh, new innovation, new services, such as shared electronic scooters, dockless bike share, and some of the innovation we see today. Uh, it has resulted in the need of having that specification, the GPFS, grow and be extended. And for that, in 2019, uh, Mobility data was chosen by NAPSA to govern and improve GPFS. In 2020, Mobility Data released a lot of GPFS improvement to better support dockless and hybrid system, uh, numerous type of vehicle, and also support better uh, personal data uh, protection. And it's still going on. Um, GBFS governance, how uh, does it work when it comes to uh, the usage by the community and your involvement in it? Any of you, any organization involved in the community can suggest a modification or extension and open a vote. That's the base of an open standard. Any GBFS producer or consumer can either vote uh, in a vote that is open or actually uh, put a veto that will need to be documented uh, and all that is through our GitHub repository. Uh, for a proposal to become part of a release candidate, we need at least three positive votes, uh, including at least a producer and a consumer and obviously no veto. From the release candidate to become an official release, there is one very important step that is at least one producer and one consumer uh, are implementing the changes. That's part of our work to uh, make sure that we keep an eye out for all the implementation uh, that will help us make a release candidate an official version. However, we can't be everywhere. So if you are working on it, please let us know. We will be very happy to hear about it and if we can help you out. A little bit uh, about the, um, the, the vote and uh, the community governance. Uh, as I said earlier, our standard is pragmatic. So we are making sure that what we propose meets the needs of producers and consumers. Uh, and there is one major role that cities play in our governance is actually that cities uh, here are also considered as consumers, so they can vote. And you have here a screenshot of a vote uh, that happened a couple of times ago already. Uh, and you see that both consumers and producers uh, vote uh, in favor of that change. So again, GBFS is publicly owned and consensus based. Now, a little bit about what GBFS can represent. It describes the current state of a mobility system. It supports real-time travel advice uh, in GBFS consuming application. Uh, you have a couple of screenshots on the side. Uh, the GBFS allows to describe vehicle and station location vehicle and dock availability, station status, for example, full or empty, uh, and basic business rules and information. More and more cities are using GBFS to have the shared mobility services that they host described. 
How is GBFS structured? Uh, it's a collection of 13 files, which uh, all together combine uh, an around 190 fields to describe all, well, at least uh, most of the different elements of shared mobility services. Some fields are required, other optional, and others conditionally required. It depends on, for example, if you are a dock-based system or a free-floating system. GBFS core areas, as I said, it represents the system, the stations, virtual or not, uh, the vehicles. Uh, it also includes some geofencing that describe a certain restriction when it comes to usage of shared mobility in some streets, in some areas, uh, parking restriction, for example, uh, pricing, and also alert about the entire system. Here are a little representation of different uh, geofence uh, areas, what can be actually represented. So you can see either no scooter zone, no ride zone uh, in these different application. These are the way GBFS can be used to uh, reserve a vehicle and or calculate uh, your itinerary. And obviously uh, uh, the integration in a trip planning application. GBFS v2.2, which is our current official version, it has been released on March 19, 2021. Uh, compared to all the other version, what it includes is pricing information uh, based on rate, time, distance, and it can also represent an estimate of the cost of the entire trip. Uh, it represents also a different type of shared mobility vehicles. Uh, it, it gives better support to geofencing, the areas that I showed you earlier, and also support to virtual station and valid station. You have the link on the GitHub where you can find all the details of each field and each file. Our latest release candidate uh, that was published in January this year, and big news, it, GPFS now supports car sharing. That is the one latest mode that we added. Uh, also describe if stations have a charging ability. It describes better vehicle drop-off restriction. Uh, it can include the vehicle icon and brand information, vehicle hold time, uh, pricing plan uh, were added to vehicle types, and it also encompass terms and privacy policy details. Uh, and here a shout out to the French Association of uh, Car Sharing stakeholders who actually supported the extension for car sharing. Again, you will have a GitHub link where you can find out all the details about it and maybe be the next producer or consumer to see to implement these changes for the version 2.3 to become the latest official one. What is coming next? That's our uh, big plan for the year 2022. It will be some major changes it, for the version 3.0 with data li license requirement, a semantic change from bike to vehicle. Now that we have a lot of different vehicle types, uh, including cars, it's, it was long overdue. Uh, the representation of opening hours will also change using the open street map format for both times and date, which will result in the depreciation of two files, uh, system hours.json and system calendar.json. Uh, we will also increase uh, options uh, for vehicle type. Uh, again, different vehicles can do different things and can be used for uh, different purposes. And there will be a complete revamp of the geofencing file because we have heard and understood that it is the one that might cause the most hurdle to produce. Uh, so keep. Uh, uh, we will keep you posted. Uh, you will obviously be asked a lot of questions from our shared mobility team. Keep an eye out for the email, them reaching out. Or if you have any suggestion, please feel free to let us know. How GPFS helped put shared mobility on the map? Well, 
uh, GBFS trains is one recognized standard internationally. It is fully interoperable with the European standards led by the European standardization body SEN. A couple of weeks ago, we have released the first canonical mapping between GBFS and uh, the European norm. It was long overdue, but now regardless of the standard you choose, you can represent shared mobility and will be compliant with the European law. It has also supported the creation of other standards such as MDS. Uh, Michael will give us uh, more details about that later. Uh, and also, for example, TOMP API. It has been used as the backbone of recent integration in tree planning application. And you can see, or at least it was uh, the screenshot I got uh, yesterday from my favorite app. Uh, I had different option for a shared bike, I, though I didn't take the trip. Um, another way for us to help putting shared mobilities on the map is the work we do for both high quality and a thriving ecosystem. On the quality side, we have a validator uh, that we inherited uh, from uh, Fluctio. So thank you for uh, to you for the long, hard technical work. Uh, it is uh, now part of the mobility data open source tools, and we will look into making uh, improving it and making sure that it stays on par with the new version of GBFS. We also have a JSON schema and we have a list, uh, systems.csv, of all the known uh, GBFS data sets to us. Uh, whenever you publish one or whenever there is one that is not listed, please let us know. Uh, Mitch will be very happy to hear about more and more adoption of GBFS. Uh, these are all open source tools. Uh, they are available on our GitHub and you have link in the presentation. So a big part of uh, data quality is actually to visualize how a GBFS data set look like in real life. And for this, we have the pleasure to have Francis to showcase uh, his tool. So I will let you share your screen. Hello, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. And can you hear me properly? Yeah, okay. So thank you, Tito. Uh, my name is uh, Francis. Uh, I'm um, part of uh, the French uh, National Access Point for Mobility Data team, and I'm a developer. Uh, so recently, we added some uh, features on the website to uh, to help visualize uh, GBFS feeds, and uh, Tito asked me to to talk to you about it. So first, I'm going to give you a little uh, a little bit of context about the, the French National Access Point, and then I will show you what we've done. Um, the, the, the French National Access Point was created in 2017, and uh, the situation back then was that only large cities were covered by a popular journey planners application. And uh, the open data was already available, but it was uh, uh, on uh, many different websites. So this is why uh, a National Access Point was created, to gather all the data at the same place. Uh, we have missions that sound a lot like uh, mobility data missions, <laughs> the way I, you, you described it. Um, so raise awareness and encourage data producers to open their data and make, make life easier for data users. So make the data discoverable and uh, make sure it's uh, of good quality. We also try to be an intermediary uh, between producers and reusers re of the data so those people can talk together. Currently on the website, we have uh, around 400 different data sets. Most of them are public transportation uh, GTFS uh, sets, uh, but recently, we have uh, we had a lot of uh, new data sets that were more real-time data sets so uh, gtfs real-time for the public transport but uh, many uh, uh, many gbfs feeds uh, were open recently and we are very uh, happy about it and um, this is why we decided to give uh, this kind of uh, data a little bit of love on our website and uh, to help uh, uh, 
people see the data that is available. So um, this is uh, the French National Access Point, and you have here a data, data set page for the city of Grenoble, which is the southeast of France. Um, you can download the, the feed here. Uh, you see also that there is a, a validation done. So this is a tool that Tuto was talking to you just a few minutes ago. It's uh, the, can I click on it? Yeah. It's, uh, it's a validation tool that is maintained by uh, mobility data that we are using to run validation automatically on the data set that, is on, uh, uh, that are on the platform. Um, what we added was uh, a map uh, on this data set so to show what's available. Uh, Tuto was asking me to explain why we, we wanted to do that. Um, so first, it's a very good way for us when we a new uh, data set is open, uh, just to check visually that everything seems all right. You don't have bias in the middle of the sea, uh, things that uh, you, you, you have uh, quite frequently. Um, and then it's a really, really good tool to communicate because if you see there is a problem, then you can send the, the link to the data producer and say, have a look at the map and then it's a, it's a really efficient way to communicate about data issues. Um, we also find that uh, it's useful for the users of the data that are coming on the website because um, you can either be a technical person who knows what GBFS is about, uh, but if, even if you know the format uh, quite well, then it's, it's always useful to have a map showing you what's inside the feed because you can have uh, feed with uh, docks or free floating geofencing areas. You can have different things and uh, you don't know before opening the feed what's inside. Uh, if you are not uh, a less technical person, maybe you are uh, a journalist or a student, uh, it's, it's very useful to, to, to see what's inside a GBFS feed if you don't know what GBFS is. So you can also figure out if the information you're looking for is inside the, the data or not. Uh, I'm showing you this one uh, because it's quite complete because you have on the same feed both uh, stations and free floating and geofencing area. So here uh, you have uh, available vehicles that are uh, in stations. You can also have available docks. If you click on the markers, then you will find uh, the, the content of the GBFS feed for this uh, station. Uh, we are not trying to make the thing extremely uh, pretty, uh, like uh, if it was uh, on an application to rent a bike, because it's really a tool to see what's inside the feed. So it's more a technical tool than uh, a user tool. Um, if you want to see the free floating vehicles, then it's the same thing. You can see why you have different colors showing you if the vehicles are available, reserved, or uh, disabled. And, uh, and uh, it's showing you inside uh, why, why uh, there is the color you see. Uh, there is another example I wanted to show you, which is in Marseille. It's, there is only three floating vehicles uh, for this feed, but uh, you see like an orange one, meaning the, the vehicle is reserved. Uh, but it's interesting because the, the geofencing is not working properly. Uh, you see, you can see that the whole area uh, is a uh, ride allowed to false. So we used this map to communicate with the data producer saying, uh, this, is, uh, this is not uh, what you, you would expect. Um, so this is uh, a visualization that is used for uh, data that is already published on the website. Uh, but um, in the best case, uh, we would like the data to arrive on the website already with a good quality. So this is why we created uh, another page that everybody can use, uh, which is uh, the um, a validation tool online. So if you go on, the, on our website, you can find it in tools, check the quality of a file or a feed. 
So you can uh, you can validate uh, many things like GTFS, GTFS RT, or other things. But you have the GBFS one, and you enter the the URL of the feed you want to validate, and then it's going to kindly ask to the mobility data validation tool uh, if there are any errors. And we also add some uh, metadata we found useful, like the time zone, or can you do cross origin requests on, uh, on this feed or not? And uh, you have the same map that I've shown you earlier uh, that you can see. And hopefully uh, the data producer can check uh, privately the, the quality of his feed before publishing it. Uh, you also have the geogisms, the, some geogisms you can download because uh, some people were asking us if they could get the uh, geogisms that were used to make the map. So if you just validate the feed, then you can download the geogism for the stations, for the free floating vehicles or for the, geof the geofencing zones. Um, so yeah, the, that's it. Uh, I will uh, give the presentation. So you have the links if you want to, and uh, also some contact information if you want to contact me or any anyone from the, my team. Thank you, Tuto. Thank you, Francis. It is amazing how many uh, tools you were able to build to actually help improve data quality for GBFS. Uh, on another topic, uh, I would like to invite uh, Sebastian to share his screen. He represents Fluctuo today and he will tell you all about the European Shared Mobility Index they have built and the insights they were able to gain from uh, the data in our industry. Yes, we see your screen. Hello, hi, Tito. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Sebastian from Fluctuo, another French, you know, on the on the conference. Uh, and uh, yeah, what I will be sharing with you uh, is uh, what we've been doing with the European Shared Mobility Index, uh, which is a uh, an index we are publishing every quarter, on which cover you know uh, quite a uh, lot of cities across Europe. I'll go very quickly, you know, on on Fluctuo for the ones who do not know us. So we. We are an aggregate of data on shared mobility. We have two main products. One, which is a real-time vehicle location API called Dataflow, which enable you to plug in a mobile app more than 260 shared mobility operators in seven or eight cities. And, uh, and then we have also a city dive, a dashboard that gives you a business analytics on across 110 cities in, in Europe. Uh, and um, yeah, so that's, you know, like basically the API, you know, is, uh, is something you can plug into a mobile app to show live vehicles, you know, around the, around end users uh, across a lot of uh, cities. And then the, the dashboard, you know, is something where, yeah, you can discover a lot of market insights and dynamics about the, uh, the uh, industry. And we have two years of uh, historical data also that is available on, on these cities. So, but let's go, uh, you know, on the, on the index. So the, the European Shared Mobility Index is something we have done uh, on which cover uh, 16 uh, cities across Europe. Uh, we've picked these cities based on the number of shared mobility services. You can see that there are cities, for example, uh, uh, like Madrid with more than 25 uh, shared mobility services. So they are really some of the, the key cities, you know, as far as the shared mobility uh, services are concerned. We've been covering uh, bikes, scooters, mopeds on uh, car sharing services, uh, and it represents, you know, uh, at the end of December, uh, more than uh, 306, uh, you know, shared mobility uh, services. So it's quite a big uh, number of services to review. So we've been really focusing on shared mobility. So I would say ride hailing services, long-term rental, corporate fleets, you know, private sharing are not a part of uh, what has been covered on the index. Uh, and um, yeah, so at least what we've seen in, uh, in 2021 is uh, the cities, you know, across these 16 uh, top European cities uh, in terms of first uh, trips per capita, you know, uh, is number one is Oslo in Norway, then we have Paris, uh, and then we have Barcelona. And in terms of growth, you know, it's been uh, uh, Stockholm and also, uh, you know, like uh, uh, cities in uh, 
uh, in uh, in uh, like Brussels, you know, uh, on Hamburg, uh, and and it's really uh, yeah we see and we've been monitoring you know the growth on the ridership across this uh, across the cities. Uh, if you look at the, um, the you know across all the cities, you know, the, in terms of total shared vehicles. Uh, the largest cities, you know, in terms of uh, number of vehicles are Paris and Berlin. So you can see on the left side, uh, you know, on, on quite a big difference versus a uh, lot of other providers. You can see also, you know, the colors are representing the different shared mobility uh, services. So you have bike sharing services with docking station, free floating bike sharing services. You have scooter, uh, you have mopeds and you have car sharing services. If we look at, uh, let's say, number of shared vehicles by inhabitants, uh, you can see that here, uh, overall, uh, Milan is, uh, is number one in terms of uh, number of vehicles uh, per population. Uh, however, it's not uh, far above, you know, like Paris, Berlin, Hamburg, uh, Brussels, and, and Stockholm. And, and you can see really the, you know, the, the mix in terms of, uh, you know, vehicles. So for, if you take, let's say, a city like Stockholm, you can see that Stockholm, it's purely and it's mainly uh, you know scooters you know that are that are available. So we really see uh, interesting uh, market dynamics uh, on depending on the, the the city policies and the, the city strategy. Uh, if we look at the overall year-on-year uh, -year ridership and uh, what we've been looking, it's comparing. Uh, you know, I mean, part of 2020 when we started this uh, index, you know, with uh, uh, toward the end of uh, 2021, and we can see that. Overall, you know, on bike sharing, uh, I would say all uh, uh, docking-based uh, bike sharing schemes, which are mainly, you know, sponsored by uh, by cities, sponsored by uh, by public uh, entities, you know, did not add a lot of growth. Uh, it's also because uh, last year, uh, 2020, was really already a year where there was a big uh, comeback, you know, after some uh, COVID lockdowns. Uh, however, on free floating, which are mainly related to private companies, we've seen quite. Uh, uh, real growth, you know, and, and with a lot of new services also being uh, launched across a lot of cities, you know, for example, London is a, is a very active city on, on bike sharing. Scooter have been uh, overall, you know, the, the, the type of vehicles that have, have seen the highest growth. Uh, um, also, uh, mopeds have been quite active, you know, in, uh, in Germany, in Netherlands, you know, in, uh, in, uh, and also in, uh, in Spain. Uh, and we, we've seen also car sharing also uh, showing some, uh, some interesting growth. As you can see, you can check also the seasonality of ridership. Obviously, you know, there are, there are part of uh, Europe where uh, in cities like Stockholm or like Oslo, of course, there is wintering and, the, you know, for, for some weeks, you know, the, the services are not live anymore. So that's something to also take into account uh, when we are monitoring the, the ridership, of course, with a peak uh, during the summer when there are a lot of tourists and a lot of people uh, uh, with uh, free time on, on, on vacation. So, uh, so if we look at... Uh, bike sharing uh, overall uh, you can see so the, the repartition of uh, number of bike sharing services you know across uh, the, the cities on the left so you can see that you know there are more and more uh, free floating services that are launched and there are more and more multiple uh, services offered to uh, to people uh, and in terms of ridership you know you can see that uh, yeah overall um, i mean uh, summer 2020 was very high but we've been ending uh, 2021 at the same level as, uh, as 2020. Uh, and uh, in terms of cities, so the, the bike sharing uh, champions in terms of uh, trips per capita, it's uh, so number one, uh, it's, uh, it's Barcelona, then it's Paris, uh, and then uh, London, which have really shown some uh, interesting uh, growth. And then also in terms of growth, uh, Bordeaux has been uh, very dynamic, uh, also along with, uh, with Paris and, and London. Uh, if we look at uh, again, you know the way uh, on in, when we come, what we have been doing, and, and you will see. So the index, uh, you know, they they can be downloaded for free. I will send you the, the URL. But we are monitoring, uh, you know, quarterly growth, you know, between services, and you can see on the left side, you know, how the number of total bikes has been changing by city, and you can see also the the split between docking station and free floating uh, uh, services, you know, with very interesting dynamics. So, for example, if you take Paris. Obviously, Velib uh, service, you know, with uh, more than twenty-five thousand bags, is uh, is uh, you know the, the number one service, and we, we can see that, for example, in Rome, there are mainly uh, free-floating services available. So that's something, uh, and with uh, also a real a real growth. And if we look at penetration, is the same. So overall, 
uh, Milan has, uh, has a very high penetration of shared bikes by inhabitants on, uh, on quite a big gap with Rome, you know, if you can see, or even with, uh, uh, with uh, let's say, some, uh, some cities in the north of Europe, which uh, have much more private, uh, you know, uh, cycling usage like, uh, like Stockholm, Oslo, or even, uh, even Rotterdam. So, so that's uh, what we've seen on the, on the bike sharing services. Uh, on, on if we look at scooters, you know, so they have been, uh, scooters have been really the, the fastest uh, growing uh, segments uh, with uh, uh, overall a plus uh, one rate in 24% of growth, you know, in terms of uh, number of trips. Oslo, uh, you know, is number one in terms of uh, trees per capita. It's mainly because, you know, it's a complete open uh, cities. And even if they have been doing some, uh, you know, some strong regulation uh, uh, last year, but overall, uh, you know, there is a very big number of players, a very stiff competition on a very high number or so of vehicles per, uh, per inhabitant. So, uh, uh, so it's been mainly uh, Oslo, Stockholm and Brussels. And then if we look at the growth, in trips, so Vienna in, uh, in Austria has, has been showing the, the, the highest growth uh, last year uh, above uh, Brussels and, and Berlin. Um, if we look at, uh, again, you know, the, the, the quarterly growth of total scooters, uh, so you can see uh, overall that uh, Berlin, you know, in terms of number of scooters uh, is by far the, the no, number one city in, uh, in Europe. Uh, however, in terms of penetration, it's more, uh, you know, Stockholm, Oslo, and uh, yeah, and also Hamburg and Berlin, which are which are high. Uh, and um, if we look, I, I'm sorry, I'm going quite fast. Of course, I, you will get the slides, you know, and, and I will also sh share with you the link so that you can download uh, all the four quarterly reports and really do an uh, in-depth uh, analysis. Uh, what we've been, what we've seen on uh, on moped sharing is definitely uh, it's a very very dynamic, uh, you know, vertical. We've seen a lot of uh, uh, services launches, you know, in South Europe, in France, in uh, uh, in the Netherlands and, and Germany, which historically have been a big market. Uh, and we can see that, uh, yeah, Barcelona remained the number one market, you know, in terms of. Uh, number of trips however the growth uh, is definitely in germany with uh, hamburg and berlin uh, being in the in the top three uh, and you can see overall that yes 20, uh, 2021 was really uh, above significantly uh, last year and it's also uh, yeah, related to the the fact that maybe you know like uh, yeah i mean bike sharing has been uh, uh, faster in terms of of growth, you know, uh, uh, after COVID than uh, than bike sharing, and that's that's something we've been uh, we've been looking at. So same on the on the mopeds, uh, and yeah, in terms of quarterly growth uh, in uh, total mopeds. So you can see that uh, even you know uh, cities, some cities you know have been growing the number of mopeds available. However, some uh, cities like, for example, Barcelona, they reduce, uh, you know, the number of mopeds and sometimes it can be uh, related to a specific uh, moped, uh, you know, a shared moped operator, uh, uh, you know, stopping uh, services. But overall, there are more and more uh, mopeds, uh, uh, you know, available in cities in Madrid, in Paris, in Milan, you know, uh, in, uh, in Rome, in Rotterdam. So it's, it's really growing across Europe and, of course, uh, Barcelona remain the number one city in terms of uh, shared uh, in, in terms of shared mopeds, uh, uh, on, in terms of penetration, mainly because there are no scooters uh, services available in uh, in Barcelona, pr primarily bike sharing and uh, on uh, moped sharing. So that's why it's uh, it's overweighted, you know, on the on the market. If we look at uh, car sharing, so it's um, it's also a very dynamic market. You can see, I mean, there are. In some cities, you know, there are 10 uh, car sharing uh, services, you know, that are available on the market. So quite a lot of competition. Uh, and we see that more and more uh, people are, are using, you know, this type of uh, vehicles. Uh, and uh, historically, uh, Germany has been, have been uh, yeah, has been really the main uh, country, you know, with uh, Berlin uh, being the, the, the number one market, you know, uh, just above Hamburg, you know, in terms of uh, number of trips. And then in terms of growth, quite uh, yeah, substantial growth in, in Madrid, Paris, and, and Brussels. So it's also, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a key segment to, to follow with, uh, with a lot of players, a lot of in investment. We, we see uh, more and more even uh, premium vehicles coming to the market, like uh, some uh, Tesla three launches, you know, across uh, some, some German cities, you know. So it's really a market that uh, is, is also moving. Uh, and you can see yeah, in terms of uh, quarterly growth, you know, in terms of total cars. So uh, Paris and Berlin are the, the number one city in terms of number of cars. And then per capita, it's uh, Oslo, uh, which is still above, uh, you know, the market. And it's mainly also, 
linked to their uh, to their parking strategy, car park strategy, where they are really putting specific parking uh, spots, you know, uh, available in the city for uh, car sharing uh, services. Uh, if we look at uh, yeah overall in a, in a nutshell what happened in uh, 2021, of course uh, it was a very big year in terms of uh, fundraising for the shared mobility industry with more than 1.2 billion euro invested uh, you know uh, in Europe alone, uh, and you can see some of the largest investment that happened. Uh, with Bolt, with Lime, with uh, with Tier on uh, on others, uh, and then you know, uh, of course, we've seen some consolidation. Uh, there there are so many services across Europe that it's normal that there is consolidation. So, for example, uh, Tier has been acquiring uh, Nextbike, uh, Go Sharing has been acquiring Zigzag. So there are there are more and more synergies and also uh, players merging, you know, to create a larger entity like uh, Zoom and Smooth, which now uh, maybe you know are called. Uh, 15 and are really trying to you know to drive you know this uh, augmented uh, bike networks across uh, across city across uh, across europe uh, what we've also seen is uh, definitely a lot of investment back into uh, into the bike uh, into the bike infrastructure with a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, aggressive cycling plan, you know, in cities like, for example, in Milan, in Paris. So it's, it's the, we, we see a more and more, uh, you know, investment across EU that will definitely drive further uh, the bike sharing uh, activities. And we've seen also last year, you know, definitely uh, the emergence of uh, uh, strong mass platforms with more and more uh, shared mobility services being plugged, uh, being available, you know, with uh, with players. I mean, one good example is a uh, free now. Uh, that is really uh, actively driving, you know, uh, shared mobility trips, you know, uh, uh, for for its ride dealing uh, customers on the, on really try to position itself as uh, as a uh, interesting, uh, you know, mass uh, mass platform. So it's we really see this trend moving where more and more they are even level two integration where you can directly book vehicles, you know, from uh, third party apps, and that's really a, a clear. Uh, a clear trend on the on the market. So, I, I know I've been running. Uh, however, you know, like uh, just to tell you, we have uh, on on the European Shared Mobility Index, we are covering every quarter four cities. So I invite you to uh, to look at this uh, city in depth analysis. You know that uh, that can give you some interesting insights of the of the the, the market dynamics. Uh, and of course, you know, like all the. All the index can be downloaded on the uh, European uh, index.fructure.com pages. You know, uh, you can just enter your, your detail and on on we will send them to you. You can also see on the page the last edition that are directly available for, for downloads. So I hope you will enjoy the report and I will be happy to get in touch with you if you have any uh, any further questions. So thank you so much for, for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. If anything, we can definitely say that the shared mobility industry is thriving and growing bigger. And to actually support this expansion, uh, I would like to invite Michael to tell us what the Open Mobility Foundation is doing, and it's a lot of work too. Great, thank you for the introduction. I will try to go kind of quickly, and my colleague, who's the executive director of the OMF, is in the chat as well. So if, I, as I'm presenting, you have questions, leave them in the chat and she could address them um, and make sure that your questions are answered. All right, so um, what I wanna to cover today, I wanna to talk a little bit about the OMF and then about the two data specs and how these data specs and how the OMF help cities and private companies manage the shared mobility ecosystem. So at part of the OMF, our vision is to manage the digital infrastructure uh, for public good. So we create data standards and open source tools. This is really a little different from mobility data where we are providing tools mostly for cities to manage the devices in the public right of way and to manage the operators, um, as opposed to something directly like uh, mass applications or um, public consumption. So uh, we have a lot of members, 50 city members. Uh, if you're interested, please join. City membership is free. You can see uh, Oslo on that list of cities. And as mentioned um, by Flukto, they're really outperforming a lot of cities. They're using every single part of MDS that's available. And um, I've done a really great job sort of managing the complex ecosystem that they have. We also have a few dozen um, advisors and private members. You can see some of them down here and there's a full list on our website. 
So we have an open approach to building, much like mobility data. We want to, we build everything in the open on GitHub, have public working groups. We want to create competitive markets for mobility services and the development of software tools. Um, and our two data specs, MDS, is used very widely around the world. And CDS, which I'll talk about our curb data spec, has already been adopted by about two dozen organizations. Um, to make all this happen, we have a governance structure. Um, all the, the work is done in the public, but the direction and the approvals of that work goes through our members. And if you are a member, you can participate in the steering committee, our strategy committee, technology council, privacy committee, and um, our board of directors as well. It's city, the board of directors is all city led. So if you're a city, um, you may be able to join the OMF board of directors. So I'm gonna talk about the mobility data specification, which is probably the one you are most familiar with because it's been around the longest and has wide adoption. It's the plumbing layer between the city government and the companies operating in the public right of way. Um, so it allows cities to communicate out to providers what the rules are, uh, how to use the public right of way, and then it gets information back from the companies to make sure that they're following those rules and to help adjust the systems accordingly. Um, MDS is it's pretty robust. This is all parts of MDS uh, on one slide. Everything here is pretty much optional. So most cities may use only 25% uh, of this or less. Um, you don't have to use it all. It's just flexible. It's built to be a kit of parts. Um, you can see it two parts of the top provider and agency get data from operators, but there are four other sections about how uh, cities send out information uh, to operators and to the public as well. So of course, with all of this, there are privacy considerations. Um, you know, the, the vehicle operators, the companies have a lot of information about riders and trips and financial data, only a subset of that um, comes through MDS, a subset of the vehicle and trip data. And the OMF has created a number of different resources. Some of them are here at the bottom, a privacy guide, a breakdown of the data in MDS, mobility data, state of practice, and a CDS privacy guide as well. Um, so we have those resources to help everyone understand what data is in there and how to best protect it. And then for those of you in the European Union, we also have guidance on using MDS under GDPR. It's a very long detailed review of which parts of MDS are subject to GDPR and a review of the applicable laws. And it answers lots of common questions you may have. Um, and it was built over a course of a few months with our privacy committee and a EU lawyer. Um, of course, use cases are important when building all of this and regulating a city, you have to know why you want to regulate. And we have a use case database of so 45 current ones um, with a breakdown for which parts of MDS you need. Uh, you can take a look at this for ideas, inspiration, and to make sure that you're um, only using the parts of MDS that you need. Um, a special feature, and this, this goes into the sort of regulation side, how to regulate shared micromobilities. With MDS 1.2, we have a new feature within the policy API called requirements, and um, it allows cities to enumerate which data specs are used by the city, MDS, GBFS, CDS, even other external ones. And it allows cities to indicate what they have available. And it can be referenced directly in permit applications and digitally updated. So and it, this is a quick example of um, how this works. I won't go into too much detail, but basically it allows you to specify which parts and fields of MDS you need for your use cases and which parts you don't need and you don't want. And uh, per the spec, the um, operators should um, honor that and not send information if you don't need it or can't handle it. Um, and this is really a great lightweight way to, um, to specify what you need, to make it clear and to publicly publish that out uh, to agencies and to the public. We've also provided for regulation purposes, sample permit and tender language. It includes um, what you might need to do to mention MDS or CDS in your tenders or permits. Um, it also includes service level agreement guidance, how to handle new releases, email templates for encouraging people to upgrade 
and other links to release support documents. So we've done some of the work for you based on best practices around the world. And then probably most exciting and maybe relevant to this conversation today as well, MDS 2.0 is being worked on. Uh, the biggest new feature is support for multiple new modes. So traditionally, we've been in the micro mobility, bike share, uh, small device sharing space. But with 2.0, we are also uh, being, being able to support passenger services, so taxis, uh, things like that, car share, which has been mentioned by mobility data and delivery robots on the sidewalk. And those are all being added because their MBS is already being used to support these in different cities. So we're taking their learnings and setting up the digital infrastructure to add it to the spec. We're also doing some extra work on policy and unifying agency and provider to make it more cohesive. So I'll touch on the curb data spec now, our second data spec. Um, the short-term vision of this is to help cities and companies pilot and scale dynamic curb zones for commercial loading activities. You can see a list of those activities below, everything from parcel delivery to freight, food and beverage, resupply, TNCs, passenger services, loading zones, et cetera. And this was developed over the course of a year. Um, you can see some steering committee members on the right there. We had 160 individuals and 70 organizations participate in the development of this, um, all built in the public. Um, we released the first version of this, the release candidate on January 25th, along with a bunch of other resources and some media. Um, so CDS is right now available for you to use for, um, for building upon, for referencing, et cetera. And uh, it's, it's being used, I'll show you a list here, of almost, by almost two dozen entities so far. Uh, on the left are uh, cities and agencies, and on the right are private companies. So these are people that are already using CDS uh, right now or in the near term. If you're using CDS, please let us know and we'll add you to the list. Uh, as part of the launch, we have a bunch of resources, website, blog post, a slide deck that you can use to uh, understand CDS more succinctly and a one pager and a bunch of implementation resources for how to implement this in your city, including the spec itself, sample policy language, like I mentioned for MDS and CDS, uh, very detailed privacy guidance, um, a pilot program guide for how to use CDS in your curb pilots. Um, so there's a lot of information out there. We tried to cover all the bases and learn from what we did with MDS with this new spec, curb data spec. And I'm just gonna give a quick overview of how it works. There are three different, what we call APIs. There's curbs, events, and metrics. Um, curbs are sort of the traditional way to code the curb to describe your physical geographic infrastructure at the curb and what the policies are there. So that's where people have typically focused. We've added another layer called events, and this is real-time or historic activity at each of those curb spaces and how to standardize the data coming from sensors, from cameras, uh, from company data feeds, et cetera. So um, there's a lot of that now consolidated in CDS. And we also have added a methodology layer for metrics for how to take those events and turn them into useful, actionable information. And the way this all fits together is a sort of virtuous loop here where the, the city defines in green the, the curb zone and what the rules are. They get events, they turn them into metrics and use those metrics to improve the curb space as well. So we're very excited about this spec and um, all of this MDS and CDS and the community of cities and companies are all working together to build tools to help cities uh, manage the public right of way, but for what's best for the residents and also helps out the companies by providing a standard way to do this. So that's all I have and I appreciate the time today. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and this is very interesting. Uh, I was actually taken uh, away by uh, the delivery robots. I didn't know it was a reality yet. Uh, happy to know that they exist and they can be described. We have three minutes left. I don't know if you have any question aside from a link to the slides. It will be provided after the event, obviously. So we have a question, I believe, from Karen about uh, car sharing for both GBFS and MDS. Uh, 
her organization has never been able to work with an open data specification because they are around trip service, meaning that all trips are booked ahead and the real time status for every uh, vehicle is irrelevant. Uh, is the upcoming support for cash sharing to include round trip cash sharing or is it just one way? Yeah. I can I can mention um, MDS. So we are actually working on that now. What we've done is to find the infrastructure in MDS for how to support the different modes. And we have a member network of people who are what what people want to support from a policy and data perspective. Um, so we're getting their feedback. So if you, I, I believe that this is something we can support um, within MDS as we develop it. If you're interested, I would say contact us so we can put you into that sort of mailing list so you can provide your feedback to make sure you get the um it's it's developed the way that you need to run your operations mitch if you're still with us uh any updates on uh, gbfs for that part yeah so in the current release candidate 2.3 rc2 um, there are fields that will take care of this. So there's a field which I believe is called available until, which would contain a timestamp for when that vehicle is a, for, for the span of time when that vehicle can be reserved. So if somebody has a reservation on that vehicle, say six hours from now, um, that information can be relayed to the user and they would know that they need to return it on or before that time. Thank you, Mitch. Well, with that, would the user also be able to request information about future availability? For example, the car might be available for the next six hours and then starting eight hours from now and going until tomorrow afternoon and then tomorrow evening going indefinitely. How no. How would we support that? Um, so... Uh, the car will typically have multiple future bookings already reserved. That's correct, but... but um, the so it's real time data and so it, it's not looking forward into the future um there isn't support for a future reservation thank you thank you michael thank you mitch for jumping in karen i hope we have answered your question at least uh, anyhow if you're looking for support to see how we can adapt this to your needs feel free to reach out uh, i'll both teams on both sides will be very happy to answer your questions more in detail. Uh, I see that we are reaching an hour of our event. It has been a great pleasure to spend this hour talking shared mobility with all of you. Once again, I would like to thank our experts, Francis, Sebastian, and Michael for their time and their presentation today. Their slides will be distributed uh, to you along with the replay of this session. You, you will have access to all our, uh, their email addresses for further questions. Thank you very much, everyone. I wish you a pleasant rest of the day and hope to see you all very soon on April 13 for our next Mobility Data Members Only event about a thriving ecosystem. Thank you.